Welcome to the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast, where we interview the world's leading CEOs, business executives, entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and authors. Our mission is to learn the strategies and tactics that have helped our guests succeed in business and life and share those lessons with you so that you can become the Bulletproof Entrepreneur. My name is Chio Dogu, and I'm the co-founder and COO of Odogu Media Group. Odogu Media Group is a podcast marketing and new media agency that helps corporations create and amplify their story via high-quality branded audio content that builds a community of highly engaged fans who are their ideal clients for their premium products and services. And now, without further ado, on with the show. Hey everyone, happy new year, happy 2020, welcome to an exciting new year for you to kickstart your entrepreneurial venture. I hope you guys had a great 2019, I hope everything ended and worked out well for you. Being the first episode of the new year, I got a special guest on the line to teach us a little bit more about how to build a better business and how to actually achieve focus and mastery so that as you're working on your venture for this new year, you're going to know exactly the steps you need to take and what you need to do to actually focus, avoid distractions, and of course, start seeing traction and results in your business. So with that said, my guest on the show today is Mr. Jordan Rayner. He's the author of the new book, Master of One, Find and Focus on the Work You Were Created to Do, and also, of course, the author of the bestseller, Call to Create, a Biblical Invitation to Create, Innovate, and Risk. He leads a growing community of Christians seeking to more deeply connect their faith with their work. He's the executive chairman of Threshold 360. He has spoken at several places like Harvard University, South by Southwest, and TEDx, and he's twice been selected as a Google Fellow. I'm pleased to have Jordan on the show today to just help us get our new year started on the right path, especially when it comes to entrepreneurship. So with that said, Jordan, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks for having me, Chi. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. Awesome, Jordan. So now I talked a little bit about your background and your bio, but tell us in your mm-hmm. own words, your origin story. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the first part of my career, I was the quintessential jack of all trades, mm-hmm. master of none, right? So uh, I had entrepreneurial tendencies pretty early on. I had started and sold a couple of companies, but I was also doing a bunch of other stuff, right? I was playing piano at a bar. I was, uh, I spent a brief time in George W. Bush's White House. So yeah, just very much jack of all trades. And listen, I, I have no problem being a jack of all trades. Uh, but I have a big problem, and increasingly throughout my career, I had a big problem with being described as a master of none, right? Because mm. I believe that work is service to the world. Work is the primary way in which I serve my neighbor. And uh, man, if there's nothing that I can point to that I'm really masterful at, that I'm really exceptional at, that's troubling to me. That's mm. problematic for me. And so my story is one of getting increasingly focused in my career as an entrepreneur. That is my one thing, right? So in the mm. vernacular of the book, Master of One, uh, it's a broad one thing, but that's my one thing. Mm. Uh, but even within that broad one thing, I I've just gotten increasingly focused in my career, just shedding off distractions to focus more intensely uh, on the work at hand, on one big project at a time, one big venture at a time. Mm. And uh, as I've gone out and interviewed other phenomenally successful, you know, multi-billionaire entrepreneurs, that seems to be the path to mastering this crazy thing we call entrepreneurship, right? It's just increasing amounts of discipline and focus. Mm. And I'm... And I'm- interested in hearing more about that just because I know for a fact that as entrepreneurs, I think yeah. the one biggest sickness we all have as entrepreneurs is the ADHD to start oh, yeah. one thing, move to the next, you know, I have to do finance, I have to do marketing, sales, this and that. So it's almost like it's inherent in every entrepreneur to at least dabble in so many things because yeah. you see something and you're like, oh, wow, I think I can make money with that. Let me go into yep. that. And then there's so many things to do in that. And then you find out it doesn't work and then you move to another thing. Yeah. So, so when you came in to the realization that it's necessary to focus. What specifically do we need to focus on as entrepreneurs? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So listen, I'll say, I'll say this. I wrote this book, Master of One, because I'm an entrepreneur and because I think this concept of focus is hardest for entrepreneurs. Exactly. We all have a million ideas. We're always distracted by the next thing. But here's what I've come to realize. You cannot uh, – you cannot chase some vision and do something that nobody else has ever done before uh, while you're simultaneously chasing other really, really big goals. It's just mm. not possible. It defies mm. the laws of science and time and trade-offs. You just can't do it. And so – now listen. Within the context of a venture, sure, there's lots of different things you need to do and being a generalist – can be a good thing within that context, but you can't be building one massive company and another massive company at the mm. same time. There are very, very, very few exceptions throughout time where that has worked. Uh, I mean, I, I would argue, you know, uh, Jack Dorsey at Twitter couldn't even do this between Twitter and Square. Steve Jobs may be the exception that proves the rule, right? Mm. Like, if you want to build something really great, you got to be, you got to be really intensely focused on. And this is really personal for me, right? So I. Um, when I, when I signed this book deal, mm -hmm. uh, I was running a very well financed tech startup at the same time. Now I see those as the same thing. That's okay. both entrepreneurship, bringing books to market, bringing tech software products to market to me is really the same skill set. Uh, but even that wasn't focused enough. I, mm. I basically came to the point in writing the book where I decided to replace myself as CEO of this venture uh, so that I could focus exclusively on bringing content products to market like my podcast, uh, like my books, et cetera. So uh, I, I have just found that that increasing level of focus is really critical for founders to build something really great. Mm. And I think you, you alluded to that in the book when you talked about um, C.S. Lewis saying, hey, yeah. you know, it's C.L. Lewis is known as an author of screw tape letters, uh, Chronicles of Nine, etc. But when you spoke with his um, stepson, I believe the information he gave you was that he's actually a masterful teacher. So basically, yeah. the vehicle with which he used to teach was just different. So he used writing, he used broadcasting with the BBC, and he taught in Oxford. So is that the same type yeah, of thing? Yeah, it's the same when, concept. When, when you That's say, okay, you're focused in entrepreneurship, but... There are several vehicles where you can actually um, disseminate the same thing. Yeah. So I talk about this in the book a lot, right? The difference between your one thing being really broad or really specific, mm. right? So C.S. Lewis is one of my great all-time heroes. And when I first had this concept for Master of One, I'm like, oh, man. One of my heroes stands in stark contrast to this hypothesis, mm. right? Like on the surface, C.S. Lewis appeared to be doing many, many different things. Mm -hmm. uh, but as you alluded to in the book, I talk about this conversation I had with his stepson who's become a good friend. And uh, Doug was explaining to me that no, like he was very intentional – about mastering one thing. That mm. one thing was just very broad. It was teaching. He was a masterful teacher in everything he did. And he applied that in a few different directions, right? He applied that to writing fiction. He applied that to writing nonfiction. Mm -hmm. He applied that to his work as a university professor, but it was all one thing. And so for me, it's the same thing. My one thing is very broad. It's mm -hmm. entrepreneurship. But even for me, I mean, I, I think C.S. Lewis was brilliant on a whole other level than I ever will be. And so for me, I, I'm not smart enough to apply my one thing in that many different directions. Mm. I, I am applying myself even more narrowly. I feel like every quarter I'm saying no to more and more things mm. so I can focus on the essential few things I feel really called to do in the world. Mm, okay. And in the book, you talk about the pathway to mastery and you yep. mentioned it being, you know, on the five broad topics, which is start with one thing, explore, choose, eliminate, and then master. So could we go sequentially and talk about sure. those topics. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the, the, the book started out with a big question, which mm -hmm. was how do the world's top performers do their most exceptional work? Mm -hmm. And listen, lots of people have written about the science of expertise and mastery. So we started by examining current academic literature, current business literature. And then I went out and I interviewed about 25 world-class masters of their craft. Tony mm -hmm. Dungy, the NFL Hall of Fame coach. Uh, we talked to C.S. Lewis's stepson. We talked to Fred Rogers' bio 
biographer. Uh, we talked to Olympic athletes, a bunch of different people, a bunch of different really impressive founders as well, mm -hmm. uh, like Scott Harrison at Charity Water. And yeah, in all those conversations, a very clear path to mastery kind of evolved, right? It's really four steps, right? The first step is exploration, mm -hmm. which is really important, especially for entrepreneurial people to explore a lot of different things, a lot of different ideas, maybe even a lot of different ventures before committing mm -hmm. to your one thing. That's step two, right? So step one, explore. Step two, commit. Step three, once you've committed to your one thing, ruthlessly eliminating mm -hmm. everything else that is distracting you. Mm -hmm. And then step four, really isn't a step. It's a lifelong process of mastery, right? Mm -hmm. So, and in that chapter, uh, we kind of break down what the three keys are to mastering whatever your vocational one thing is. Now, when you talk about elimination, elimination mm -hmm. kind of makes it even more narrow. So take, for example, someone like you that has said your main thing is entrepreneurship and then, yep. you know, focus on content products. Elimination could also be seen as like, pulling the venture backwards, you know? So yeah. if, if, for example, you're an entrepreneur and you say, okay, I have to be the CEO, but I'm just starting up, so I have to wear many hats. Yep. If you start eliminating things and you don't have the funds to bring on people to take on those roles, that could also slow down the process. So, so how does one wisely follow that elimination step to ensure that they're going on the right track? Yeah, so I'll caveat this by saying that, like, if you're an entrepreneur, your one thing in the early stages of that venture is just getting to a profitable business model. And, and to do that, you do have to do everything, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So so over time, you get increasingly focused on the few things that you should be doing, mm -hmm. hiring, casting vision, maybe sales, depending on what, what type of CEO you are. Right. Uh, but, but, but that was true. That's true in my own career in each of my ventures. I've sold two ventures. I've successfully exited a third that I'm currently serving as chairman of the board of, uh, in, in each of those experiences, my res the list of my responsibilities got, uh, increasingly small, uh, as the venture evolved and matured and we were able to bring other people in. So I was constantly eliminating things from my plate as I was able to recruit the right people to take on the responsibilities that I was formerly doing. Mm, okay. Now let, let's dive a little bit more towards the religious aspect or the Christian aspect of yeah. the book and the inspiration behind you writing the book. You talked a lot in the book about, you know, the Christian faith while yep. God calls us to excellence and, you know, mastery and stuff like that. So in, in your own reading and study of the Bible, what were some of the key lessons you learned about, you know, being exceptional and taking that to the marketplace? Yeah, so this is part of what drew me to the Christian faith and continues to draw me to the Christian faith, right? Uh, number one, the Bible is the only religious text uh, in the world that says that God himself worked. <laughs> mm. I love that, right? So uh, every other religion says that the gods created human beings to work and serve the gods. Only Christianity says, no, God himself worked. The very mm. first pages of the Bible is God rolling up his sleeves, creating in service of us. Mm -hmm. That's a radical idea, right? Uh, and, and work was service, right? God didn't need to create us. He had no reason to create us, but mm -hmm. he did it out of love. He did it out of service to share his perfection with us. And that's a, that's a glorious thing. And I think that's an interesting way to think about entrepreneurship, right? Is taking risks to create new things, not primarily for ourselves, not mm -hmm. for our own fame and fortune, but as a means of serving the world, as a means of serving others. And so, I mean, that's the highest level inspiration. But the second insight uh, is really based on, on, on 1 Corinthians 1031, which says that in whatever you do, do all things for the glory of God. Mm. And, uh, you know, glory of God, people – even within the church, have no idea what that means a lot of times. Uh, I, I heard one pastor I really respect once say, um, to glorify God is simply to reveal his character, right? And what is the character of God? The character of God is excellence. Go look at a mountain. Go look at a sunset. His creations are exceptional. Mm. And so as an entrepreneur, I think a lot about that. I think a lot about reflecting that character to the world by having really high standards of excellence. Now, as a Christian, I believe in grace. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and so it is not a standard of perfection, uh, okay. but it is a standard of excellence. Because I, I was going to ask you about that, because if you say you're trying to hold yourself to a higher standard, that means yeah. perfection. Yeah. Usually, as human beings, we are flawed. You know, we can never get to that perfect pinnacle, Correct. no matter what we do. And Correct. there's this saying that, you know, a good 
is always better than you know perfect. Yeah. So as yeah, long done as is better than perfect. Yeah. So as long as that's done, then we go from there. But when you read through um, heroes of faith, so people like Paul, for example, who yep. was a very good legal scholar before he now switched to becoming a Christian, you find that even then there was this level of mastery in his work. You know, when he was persecuting the yeah. Jews, he was persecuting Christians with mastery. Now, when he became a Christian, he, he did the work and preached with mastery. So, mm -hmm. in a world where we live in now, where we're like, okay, we're trying to show the excellency of God in the world, in our craft, in our work. It, a lot of people will also say, yeah, but the world is inherently evil and bad. And Correct. You yep. cannot bring the, the salt and light to the world because it's a little difficult because you don't control mm -hmm. everything. So what would you say in such an argument? Uh, how, yeah, how so I, one, I, I, yeah, yeah, right. So <laughs> we're, get, we're, getting real, we're getting really theological, but I would say, <laughs> first of all, first of all, the world is not inherently uh, evil, okay. right? The, the world was created as good, and the Bible teaches that uh, you know, our eternal home is not some cartoonish cloud in the sky. It's right here on earth. Jesus mm. is going to come back here and create a new earth for us to live on. Right. So it's not inherently bad. It is sinful, right? Sin sinful, entered the world. Yes. Right. And so we, we, we struggle, we struggle with that. We struggle with the pain, uh, of sin. Uh, but yet, you know, I, as Christians, listen, uh, victory has been won when Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead three days later. That was the inauguration of what the Bible calls the kingdom of heaven, mm -hmm. uh, what Christians believe will be the eternal rule of Jesus on earth at some point in history. And post his resurrection, uh, we are called to be signposts to that kingdom. We are mm -hmm. called to create businesses that reveal truth, that reveal the truth and the character of that kingdom, mm -hmm. right? And so in that way— I think we make the Christian faith winsome and attractive, and we don't have to preach the gospel everywhere we go, right? I don't believe in that at all, right? Mm. I hate the I hate the coffee shop that has all of the T's in their logos, crosses. No offense if but you're that guy that owns that fish, coffee shop, yeah. but I hate that, right? Uh, we're, we're just called to create great products and create great services and serve people really well uh, because that's what Jesus called us to do. Love mm. your neighbor as yourself. yourself was a complete sentence. It wasn't love your neighbor as yourself so that you can tell them about me. Mm -hmm. Love your neighbor as yourself is good in and of itself. And I think a lot of Christians forget that. Yeah. And I, I think that even reminds me of um, Chick-fil-A. Um, yeah. I think they're the fastest growing fast food company, you know, close on Sundays, no matter what happens. And all their employees get a break. And it's not just because whether you're a Christian or Muslim, I, I believe they hire across the board, but they treat oh, yeah. people... Yeah the same regardless because that's yep. the faith and that's the values that they share and i don't think i've ever heard any christian message or anything like that in a chick-fil-a store so it's interesting to say that you know what yeah your value should shine and that should in and of itself win people over but yeah um as business owners and especially as christian business owners when it comes to you know what sharing your faith in the marketplace how would you advise um people in the faith to go about it. Now, we don't want to hit them over the head, but you want to win them over. So what are some of your own steps to like, hey, say, you know, this is the reason why I am like this. This is why I have this excellent uh, skills and process in place. And this is, you know, the faith that I believe that has helped me get to where I am. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I think of the church, to be honest, I think we place a little bit too much emphasis on this. I think a lot mm -hmm. of times we think that the only purpose of life and business is to share the gospel and, and beat it over people's heads. And I just don't believe that's true. Again, love your neighbor as yourself. Love your employer as yourself. Love your employees as yourself. That If that's the only thing you do, that is good mm. in and of itself, period, full stop. Right now, I think when you do that well, when you focus first on – mastering your craft, when you prioritize mastery of your craft over whatever message you may want to share with the world, I think that very naturally leads to opportunities mm. to share that message. I think people are, I think mastery is winsome. I think people are attracted to people who are exceptional at their crafts. And that just very naturally paves the way in a very organic way to share why you're different, right? I've had that mm. in my career. I've had lots of employees come to me like, Hey, 
you have these like crazy high standards. You're really committed to excellence, but you don't, you know, it's not perfection. Like mm-hmm. what, what's the deal there? And I'm mm-hmm. able, I'm able to share, uh, why that is. And that's really rooted in my faith, but I don't go around preaching to my employees, mm-hmm. right? I just try to do the work, do the work exceptionally well, serve my team really well. And in my experience, that just a lot of times opens up doors for a very real conversation. Mm. And what have been some of the biggest challenges you've faced in your business world? I know you've exited two companies, the yep. uh, process of exiting the third one. There must have been ups and downs and challenges that you've surmounted. So what were some of those major challenges and how did you oh, overcome man. them? A million challenges, but I would argue the most significant one for any founder, uh, including myself, is – the ability to discern the essential from the noise, mm. the ability to, in the context of a day, a week, a month, a quarter, understand that pretty much everything competing for your attention that looks important is not mm. at all, right, mm. in the grand scheme of things. And so being disciplined to identify what 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 really matters mm. and, and having the discipline to stay focused on that. Because a lot of times the most important things are not the most fun things, mm. right? And so like for example, I, t- I tell founders all the time uh, that don't have like publicity driven businesses, like why are you spending time on podcasts? This doesn't make any sense. I get it's fun, right? It's, mm. re- it's, re- it's really fun that you're doing that, but it, but it has no bearing on your business and being self-sustainable. So like why are you wasting your time with this, right? Mm. Uh, and that, that's just one example. Right. But a lot of times the things that are important, um, you know, aren't, aren't fun. And so just having the discipline to do that, when, you know, when you're in the early throes of a venture, really all that matters is like getting customers and making them happy period. Yeah. Right. So if you're doing anything other than that and, and, and recruiting a great team, if you're at that stage, mm-hmm. right. And keeping those happy, anything outside of that is just, I don't know. It just doesn't, it just doesn't matter. So, mm. uh, that, that's the hardest part I think for any founder. Mm, okay. And looking back on your career thus far, were there some things you think you could have done differently? Well, maybe some, you know, managerial issues that yeah. came up that you could have handled differently. So could you give an example of, take for example, something you think you could have done differently that would have either changed the course of yeah, the direction sure. of your career or your business? Yeah, I think the biggest one for me is, you know, uh, entrepreneurs are most entrepreneurs that I met are addicted to sales. Sales is fun, right? Mm -hmm. Like getting that win, signing the contract is fun. And as soon as you do it, it's like a high, right? You want to move on and find the next one really quickly. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest mistakes I've made in my career as a founder is, uh, moving too quickly from sale to sale Mm -hmm. before making sure that the customer I just signed is exceptionally happy, like over the moon, happy that they're telling all of their friends about the product without me even asking them, right? Because at the end of the day, the cheapest way to acquire happy customers is by making your current customer customers exceptionally happy, right? Uh, so th- I, I see a lot of founders fall in the, into that trap. Mm, okay. I think I myself fall, fall into that trap because I just remembered uh, a day or two days ago, I was on the phone with a potential client and then I closed the sale and then I was like, oh man, I need another song yeah. to like strut and dance to and I was like, wait, hold on a second. I just yeah. signed the deal, but I've not like worked on the work yet. So right. it's very cool. Very interesting. So as we start to wind down the episode, um, Jordan, um, you know, it's the new year. People are make it up their resolutions, they're coming up with plans and goals and targets to achieve for the new year, so personally and professionally. So in your own process, how do you plan for the new year and what is some of your advice, given the fact that you've just released this book, Master of One, to help people develop better plans on how they will exceed their expectations for the year? Yeah, so I do planning on a far more frequent basis than annually. So I, I do planning on a pretty much a quarterly basis. I actually don't do annual plans. Like I plan mm. quarter to quarter. And so there's two resources for me that that I, I recommend for this. Uh, number one is the book Measure What Matters mm. by John Doerr. Uh, it basically teaches the OKR goal setting framework that Google and 
Amazon and pretty much every major company in the world uses. I'm a huge fan of OKRs. Uh, so that's number one. And number two, on a much more practical day-to-day level of how I you know plan and, 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 and manage projects, uh, Getting Things Done by David Allen has probably influenced me more than any other book professionally ever. Uh, it's the most boring book ever. No offense, David. Uh, I love it. It's changed my life. But – it's a transformative book. I, I tell young people all the time, if you master the workflow of GTD, you will be more effective and more productive than 99% of people because most people don't implement this, this methodology. So th- mm-hmm. those are the two, those are the two books that really describe how I plan on a quarterly basis. Okay, cool. And I'll be sure to link that in the show notes when yeah. this episode is ready to go live. So Jordan, thanks a lot for coming to share your story and teach us more about how to become masters of one and become better yeah. professionals and better entrepreneurs. But before I let you go, tell us a little bit more about where we can get the book, uh, yeah. where we can buy it, where we can connect with you and learn more about you and the work that you do. Yeah. So listen, hopefully you're excited about the book just by this conversation. But if that's not enough, I'm actually giving away a trip to Europe for two people uh, who pre-order the book. So if you go to jordanrainer.com, uh, that's J O R D A N R A Y N O R dot com. You can pre order Master of One right there and enter to win this epic trip we're giving away. So you're going to go on a seven night European cruise on a nice cruise line, not a crappy cruise line. You're going to go on Royal Caribbean. Uh, then I'm going to meet you in Barcelona uh, mm-hmm. and take you to dinner in one of my favorite cities. Uh, and then you're going to go tour this church called La Sagrada Familia. It's mm-hmm. the largest church in the world. It's been – it's still under construction. It's been under construction for 135 years, yeah. uh, and it was designed by a true master of one, this great architect named Gaudi who spent uh, decades doing a bunch of different projects around Barcelona until – he found one that he really wanted to master, spent the last 12 years of his life just focused on this church. And it is – I've traveled all over the world. To this day, it's the most spectacular thing I've ever seen in oh. person. So uh, you got to see it, and I'm going to pay for you to go see it. So yeah, go to jordanrainer.com to uh, enter the sweepstakes. All right. So you heard that, folks. If you want to win a free vacation to um, Europe – Better go pre-order the book. I'll probably go do that myself because I want that. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. So thanks a lot for coming on the show, Jordan. I truly appreciate you taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chief. How to be better entrepreneurs in the new year. Yeah, thanks, man. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning into the show today. If you love what you hear on today's episode of the podcast, go to iTunes and leave a review and a comment. It helps other great listeners like yourself find the show. And of course, you can always find more episodes of the Bulletproof Entrepreneur Podcast at www.odogwu.com.